Okay. Well, well, let's see. So um, the idea of today, actually, what Jason and I had on the schedule was to talk about compliance questions and latest issues. So I've got a few um, issue things that we will talk about. And then uh, if you want, uh, Christine, you can ask uh, your questions and we'll uh, we'll see if, if it is something we want to take offline or, or stay online. So anyway. So here's what I thought I would start with is um, really kind of two main things that I thought I would cover that um, Jason and I have run into during this week. And then um, we'll kind of take it from there. So a little bit less uh, formal today, more of an informal kind of a thing. But um, first one is something that we have been seeing quite a bit lately. And, and I've been surprised because in the mandatory residential class, we talk about this in the class. And I always feel like when we talk about it in the class that I'm like, this is something that I feel like everybody knows. And I don't know why we put this, or when I say we, meaning the division has this in the class. But like I say, this last week or two, Jason and I have seen this quite a bit lately. So that is when, when doing a, an offer, whether you're accepting or you're countering or rejecting whatever it is that you're doing when you get an offer in, what we are seeing is a lot of times an agent will take the real estate purchase contract and they will say, we're going to counter this because they're thinking they want to counter something specific from the real estate purchase contract. But then on an addendum to that, whether it's an FHA, VA addendum or some other addendum, they're saying, we're okay with all of the terms they put on here. And so they're checking acceptance on that. Or we've seen it vice versa, where they're countering everything else. And ex wait, no, I said that. Countering the REPC, accepting the addendum, or they're accepting the REPC and then countering on the addendum to say we want to modify some of these things. And so just thought it would be good to do as a reminder that when you get an offer in and you're going to do a counter offer to that, or if you're going to accept it, you accept the REPC and all addendums, or you're going to counter the REPC and all addendums and make sure that you are pointing all of them to see to the same addendum because we actually did see one this last week where like part of it was a, a, a countered and referenced that the counter was to hey mike i'm going to mute you because i think there's some background noise i think it's you oh i'm sorry so um anyway we we saw one where it was like one part of an addendum was countering to addendum four Another one countered to addendum four and five, and then another one is countered to just addendum five. So it was very confusing. And, and for me, and maybe part of why I've just always felt like that it, it made sense to me is because I worked in a bank before I came into real estate and everything we did in the bank was about paper trail. What's the paper trail? What's the paper trail you're leaving? And so, so I just would say to kind of keep in mind as you're getting offers and then you're doing counter offers to them of what is the paper trail meaning if this transaction were to end up in court is is it going to be clear for somebody to look at and see whether it's a judge or a jury to look at and see that everything is pointed to this one addendum meaning is it all flow properly and we don't want to have any ambiguity inside of the contract and so um so anyway just a, a reminder on that, as you get an offer in and you're going to do a counter, you should be countering the offer and any addendums that they've given you so that everything points to the one counter offer rather than accepting one, countering the other, because then it becomes confusing as to did you try to counter it or were you meaning to accept the whole entire thing? So anyway, any thoughts? Questions on that? Anything, Jason, you want to add to what I said? Yeah, one one thing real quick, just so everyone knows, we were uh, Russ and I were talking with uh, an attorney on you know things that are uh, unclear in contracts, and the way that they side typically is whatever agent created the problem. It's 
most likely going to go against that client. So if you are the buyer's agent and you created the problem that becomes unclear, they're most likely going to go with the, the seller's opinion of it than the client than the buyers just because you're the one that created it. So we want to not be as we want to be as clear as possible. And what Russ is saying is looking at that trail. If you as the agent is are making the contract unclear, it will probably go against you if it ever had to get defined, is what we what the consensus we heard from it. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Jason. I forgot about that. And and yeah, that's a, a huge thing to keep in mind is that if there is ambiguity and they're looking at it, trying to figure out what was meant, they're not going to go in favor of what, if, if it could go either way, it's probably not going to go in favor of your client. So cool. Good. Can Any I other comment on this? Yes. I think this was a really good thing because when I was a newer agent, even, you know, a couple of years in and I was on the listing side, it wasn't intuitive to me to say, I have to counter everything, you know, it was like, I didn't realize that did it right because I asked someone, but I didn't understand that you needed to do that counter, 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 here's my addendum, and then they can accept it or, you know, but I didn't realize that. So I think this is a really good thing to bring up. Yeah, and thank you. And then the other, the other thing, just to add to that, Chris, would probably that I would say is just Keep in mind that on those, so like, let's say that that they accepted the Repsy and then counter or rejected maybe an addendum. On that addendum, it says to the extent the terms of this contract modify or conflict with a previous one, that the terms of that addendum will be the the um, the right one. I guess that, that's not the right wording, but. But so if for some reason they signed the one and then the clock changed from 11 to 1101 or something like that, and now they're saying they rejected, that contract says the terms of this one will, if it modifies or conflicts, well, if one was accepted and one's rejected, that addendum says if it, mod, if it conflicts, which now you would have, that the terms on the addendum control. Well, now all of a sudden, now you've actually really rejected the entire contract. So anyway, just to keep things clear, just always a good reminder that that's how we want to go about it on that. So any other thoughts or comments on that? Okay, so the other one that I thought we would talk about was um, Jason had someone ask a question about disclosing that um, they were related to a particular client. And, and so um, we had a discussion and I thought it would be good to carry that over a little bit for, for you guys, because I actually just this morning learned something new on that. And so let me give you the kind of the background. So I, I early on in my real estate career, I had, and I don't even remember where this came about, but I had a scenario where somebody said, oh, you should have disclosed that you were related to that person. And so I had called up over to Stringham where I had gone to real estate school and was said, I'm confused on this because I feel like there, it, it shouldn't matter. And what I mean by that is it, if Michael is representing the seller and I'm representing the buyer, does it matter that I tell Michael that my mom is the buyer? Because I have a fiduciary duty to represent my client and it shouldn't change based on if it's my mom or not, and it shouldn't affect Michael. Well, if though it was my listing and my mom was coming as the buyer, well, then now I see, yeah, you should disclose that you're related to the buyer because now you're representing both the seller and the buyer. And clearly, as much as I have fiduciary duties, it's still my mom. And so it's fair for the seller to know, hey, it's his mom that he's representing. So I've always kind of had this question of, of why does it matter if it's not a limited agency scenario? And so I uh, called and talked to the, to the legal hotline this morning. And when I talked to him, what he pointed out, which I thought would be good for us to talk about for a minute, because I always felt like that was more from a division standpoint that the division was saying, hey, in order to be fair, you need to disclose this. 
But really, more so from the division, it's you do have those fiduciary duties and it shouldn't change. And so this morning, as I talked to Lance on the UAR hotline, he pointed me to this. So let me bring up and I'll do a screen share. So hopefully you guys are seeing. Are you guys seeing the code of ethics on your screen? Okay, good. All right. So he pointed out right here in Article 4 says, Realtors shall not acquire an interest in or buy or present offers for themselves, any member of their immediate families, their firms, or any members thereof, or any entities in which they have any ownership interest, any real property, without making their true position known to the owner or the owner's agent or the broker, and then goes on to, in selling property they own or in which they have an interest, realtors shall reveal their ownership interest in writing to the purchaser or the purchaser's representative. So really, this, this makes more sense to me now because it is one of our articles in the Code of Ethics that we won't acquire an interest in or buy or present offers from ourselves, any member of their immediate families. And then he went on to, to share with us um, what the manual then defines as that, but it leaves it a little bit broad, meaning it says your immediate family, and then it defined that as your parents, your siblings, your um, grandkids, and then what? Do you remember what the word was, Jason? Something or or uh, something? I can't remember how it was worded, but basically, it left it open to saying that if you're related, you should disclose it to them. So. Here's kind of, I guess, at the end of the day, based on that, my my opinion has changed a little bit because I was feeling like prior to this morning that unless you're in a limited agency situation, it doesn't matter that much. But the truth is, when it comes down to it's a it's one of our articles in the code of ethics that we would disclose that. So anyway, just kind Can of I ask a question there. Um, absolutely. So if you have a say a nephew um, that you're representing. And they are the buyer. Do you, is it on the buy side or the sell side or both sides? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay, yep. perfect. But nephews yes. would say, because I wouldn't think there would be immediate family, but just do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably here's how my feeling is. And then Jason, if yours is different after what I say, then please share. But but for me, after our call today with him, I kind of felt like if you have the question in your mind, should I disclose that I'm related to this person, then you probably should. But I would say if it was a nephew and you and you didn't think about it and you didn't do it, you're probably OK. But if it was a brother or a sister, yeah, you, you probably run the risk. So here's, I guess, at the end of the day, because it is a code of ethics issue. If somebody were to really where this is going to become a problem is just if for some reason something in the transaction occurs that had the other side known you were related to them, that it would have made a difference, then they would file a complaint at the board saying that you had violated the Code of Ethics, Article 4, and then they would have a hearing where you would go and present your side of why you didn't disclose that you were related. They would present why it made a difference. And a panel of your peers would hear that and then look at Article 4 to say, did they violate that? So, so yeah, it, a nephew, could it be? Probably they could say that, but I think it really is going to just depend on the scenario. So I guess to me, I would just say, if you have the thought, I wonder if I should disclose that I'm related this way. Then you probably should. Any difference of opinion there, Jason? No, I think that was that's that's exactly what I interpreted when he said that. Um, I mean, it's the same thing with the seller's disclosures. If you're questioning it, just put it down. You're going to be safer by putting it down than not. Uh, the question came up for us because it was a um, sister-in-law that was buying a property. They wanted to accept the contract as it was. They were the seller. And they didn't want to counter it with a uh, notice of interest. So they were asking us whether that was we had to do that or not. But I mean, the reality is, is if it affects the contract and disclosing it would have saved you, that's probably the best route to do it. I would say a nephew, I mean, 99% of the time, if it's if it's a limited agency, you need to do it. It's going to cause problems if you don't. If it's not, I can't Russ and I were both talked about there's. There's not very many scenarios that 
are going to go against you on that. But if you have that question, I would always just disclose. Yep, perfect. Okay, cool. So what other questions and things? Chris, you said you had one. Does anybody else have I questions? Do. Um, so this goes with, um, and maybe this is more of a lender type question. It, anyway, with FHA, there's a lot of people, a lot of things that I see on the webs, the Utah real estate that lists FHA that they accept FHA, but you can tell, you can clearly see from the pictures that there's no way that it would be accepted from FHA standpoints. Maybe there's a, no toilet there or a sink missing or, you know, safety things that, what, I mean, do you just, what do you do in that when you're representing a buyer and they are going FHA, what do you do with that? And then, oh, and then one other question I had, pre-19 or post-1978, does peeling paint matter for FHA if it's after 78? If the property was built 1978 or newer, then that should, it, well, it's not going to matter in terms of lead paint, but they may still call it to say you need to, to get it painted. But it's possible, yeah, but they but it's probably not going to be as big of a deal because if it's after 1978, you could just go scrape and paint versus technically if it's potential lead-based paint, they need the hazmat suits to to clean it up. So yeah, the, F and the then, FHA one is different than the lead-based paint. They're two different things. If they're flagging the chipping paint, it's not it has nothing to do with the the lead-based paint. They're more just flagging the chipping of the paint. So that I look at those as two different things that FHA right. will look at. Okay, great. Yep, I'd agree. Yeah. And then so back to your initial question though, um I'm not sure that I fully understand the question besides if if an agent's put that it's FHA and you can see there's not a toilet there, I would say, you know, you really one of two options is one is you're going to tell your client this property is not going to be approved in its current condition for an FHA loan. Therefore, on your um, FHA VA addendum under the section of the, the seller will make any appraisal required repairs, I would just say to build in the amount of money that you're going to put there to be enough that would allow that seller to bring it up to the FHA standards. That way, if they're agreeing to do FHA and they've agreed to spend up to, say, $5,000 on that and FHA calls for it, you've already got an agreement that the seller is going to do it. Now, with that being said, I would say just talk to the agent and say, hey, we're sending this over. We're asking for this. You put that it's FHA. You know, clearly they're going to need to put in a toilet. So can we get it done before the appraisal? Right. And see, because that's my thing. You're going to have an inspection and different things. And if it doesn't, you know, they're not, they come back and say, oh, okay, well, we're not going to do it. You know, <laughs> so you have, you know, those types of things. I'm just looking at from a, a buyer's oh, sure. to kind of help. The, if, I can, you know. if I can chime in on a couple of things. One, one thing, and Russ and I have this this morning with the MLS is, just because it's on the MLS doesn't mean it's um, 100 percent accurate. And I think as buyers agents, we're getting in the habit of looking at the MLS and saying everything on the MLS is accurate and 100 percent true. And we're not doing our due diligence in areas that are important. And so what you're right, Chris, is yes, it might say on the MLS FHA approved. And you might want to look at that and say, OK, well, I don't know if this, if we're going to have a problem down the road, uh, the one good thing from the buyer, if it's FHA, um, any inspection issues that come up with FHA is going to affect um, the appraisal on it and getting and getting the value. And you can't lose your earnest money on an FHA or a VA loan if the value is not there. So your buyer is going to be protected if there's no toilet in there and they come back and say, hey, there's no toilet, so we can't qualify. 
and we can't lose our earnest money because the value is not there. You don't have a toilet in there. You're still protecting your buyer. I just want to make sure that everyone's starting to pay more attention to the MLS and not relying on the seller's agent doing their job, which, you know, I mean, hopefully you guys are doing your job as seller's agents too. But uh, we saw that very same thing. In fact, I think, I don't know if it's solved yet, Russ, if you know with that one, but that's something we're dealing with today that the seller, the buyers took the MLS as the truth and now it's realizing it's not. So they yeah, can still so, their inspection money though. Their, ins their inspection yeah, money? Yeah, what they paid for inspection, what, yes. What they paid for an inspection. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. Any other questions? Um, I have a question. It might be kind of silly because I'm a new agent, but um, so in, in regards to the lead paint, um, if someone is selling their house, I, I've heard a lot about you know, repainting, sealing the chipping paint and stuff. When they put siding on, does that, is that effectively the same thing when they, when it's covered in new siding? Um, or, or do, I just, I don't know a lot about the whole lead paint thing. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So I would say like, if, if a seller just were to, had a home there, it had chipped or peeling paint that was built prior to 78, and they just put siding up, you're not going to ever have an issue from the standpoint of getting a loan on the property, that type of a thing. If the appraiser's gone out and seen it and said, hey, there's chipped paint it needs to be repaired, and they went and put siding over it, I think they would have to first show that they had that taken care of appropriately before they put this siding on. Okay. Yeah. So if, if it got, it's professionally done, the ciders will catch that anyway, right? Because they wouldn't want to mess with it, I would think. Uh, no, I think they probably would just throw siding up over it. <laughs> probably. I, I, yeah, honestly, I don't think they would, because pro probably most of them don't really know and don't really care. Okay. But so, yeah, just uh, if it's an FHA, they would just say, you got to get it done a prop properly, which is they have to come out and sand it with a machine that's not going to throw dust everywhere. Right. right. So. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yep. I have a question, Russ, just a little bit about um, a cash buyer. So if obviously if, if they're paying cash, they don't need financing and they could choose on the rep C to have an appraisal or not have an appraisal. So if they chose to have an appraisal and we marked yes on that box, and then we get into it a little bit and they decide not to have an appraisal, are they obligated to have an appraisal because they marked yes? No, nope. Okay. If it's a cash transaction and they put on there that they were gonna do an appraisal, if they didn't do one, it would totally be fine. Okay, and they, um, you would just, they would just get a private appraisal company to, to do that appraisal? And then typically we close at the seller's title company. Well, yeah, you just have to correct? close at the same title company. So if oh, you, okay. um, yeah, if it's a cash transaction, and the reason for that is the the title insurance industry says that the title companies have to be basic paid for their services. And so there, when there's a cash transaction, there's no lender's policy of title insurance. Right. So if they wanted to close at a different one and wanted to pay for a lender's policy, then you actually could do a split closing that way. It's just that if there's not a lender's policy, they have to close at the same title company. And that makes that's the reason why a, a buyer's paying cash, their closing costs are so much less is because they're not paying for title insurance for the lender. Correct. Yep. And all the yep, and all the lender fees and all that stuff. The, Correct. Okay. Okay. Yep. And then just one more quick question about um just the seller's or buyer's response time. They sign up past that time and yet they go ahead and accept the addendum, but it was past the time. Is it best to just go ahead and do a follow-up addendum correcting those set those response times that were missed? Yeah, if you're accepting one after the deadline, then yes. You, you really okay. should just do a counter. In the event, though, that you are countering after the deadline and then they accept that, you don't need to go and, and do that. Because in essence, by doing a counter offer, 
is a new offer to them. And okay. it, it's, if, if they were not agreeing to it because you didn't do it within the time frame, they would just reject your counter offer and it would be done. So does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yes. Okay. Yes. And yeah, then just, just as to... long as, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I just going to say, as long as it, if you're accepting after the deadline, you really should, you'll need to do a counter or either do a counter or just an addendum afterwards clarifying. But if you're countering after the deadline, you don't need to. Okay. Okay. And then just to you guys' point on the MLS and watching it closely, I just did an offer on a condominium actually. And they had put, um, I called the agent on a couple of things. The square footage was more on the MLS than what was on the tax data. They had put that there was irrigation and private water shares and things on this condominium. And, and one other thing, oh, they had put that there was a home warranty. So I asked her about the home warranty and she's like, oh, I just copied and pasted the one before. And so there were three things on this one property on the MLS that were totally incorrect. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately that it's a good lesson that way of don't, don't just copy, but yeah, that's kind of funny that there's uh, water shares on a condominium. A condominium. So. Hey, thanks for your time. <laughs> yep. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions? If not, we'll uh, wrap it up. Thanks guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for being on. Thank you. Have a good day.